Thank you for coming and filling up the room to learn some details about what ANSI teased this morning. So we're going to go into a big deep dive today on PCF 2.0. What is it? Why does it matter? And the like. My name is Richard. I work for Pivotal. I'm joined here by Jeffrey. He works for Forrester. And I asked him to actually kick off this session with a bit of context. He does a lot of research into developer trends and organizational change and things like that. And I thought it would be useful to kind of set the table with a first few minutes of uh, interesting insight. And then we'll go into a deep dive of PCF. I'll do a couple of demos, which have at least a 70% chance of working. So I'm really excited about today. Thanks a lot, Richard. I think one of the things that I want to do as part of the brief time I have up here is really try to set the stage and put some questions out there. When you think about any sort of platform investment, whether it's PCF or whether it's something else, uh, you have to view it within the context of the overall set of challenges that you're trying to solve and ask, how is this going to help me? How is this going to drive a better result? Because in the end, we're not about rolling out platforms and making them the focus of our attention. We're about building applications or solutions, creating great customer experiences. And we have to ask how the platforms are going to help us uh, do that. So with that, um, I want to, as Richard said, set some context here. So we survey lots of decision makers every year, business decision makers, as well as uh, uh, technology decision makers. And one of the questions that we ask them is, what's important to you? What are your top business priorities? What are you trying to accomplish? And of course, you, know, you would expect business decision makers, technical decision makers even, to say, growing revenue is important to us because you know, we're in business. But what's interesting about this is if you look at the next priorities that they have, there's a common link here which is all about the customer and serving the customer better. At Forrester, one of the things that we see is that we're in what we would call the age of the customer, where the customer has more power, they have more decision-making ability, uh, substitutability is higher, and that ability to appeal to the customer and make it easy to choose your product, easy to build loyalty around your product is incredibly important. That goes to digital experience, as well as the products that you build, the smart products that you might create. So how is, that's my first question to Richard, when we look at PCF 2.0, how's it going to help me with my customer experience to solve these, these business priorities, which are so important to me? Let's drill in on that, then, in terms of what software decision makers are thinking and how they're dealing with the priorities that they have from a business perspective. When we ask these decision makers what initiatives are likely to be their organization's top priorities over the next 12 months, you see, again, some very interesting uh, things here. We need to be able to update or modernize our legacy applications. Why? Because they're not very useful, because they're not used by our customers, because we have employees in the way and our employees can't serve our customers in a way that they expect. Um, we need to increase our use of custom development and uh, for better business support and our differentiation. So this one is really interesting. I was talking with uh, um, a dev team yesterday and about their, their, their pivotal journey. And one of the things that they said was, once we put the platform out there, we weren't sure how many applications were going to show up. And then we saw about 40 or 50 show up. And we realized that there was actually a lot more custom application development going on in our organization than we thought. This is almost in direct opposition to where we saw the industry going maybe five to 10 years ago. I remember having a conversation with a client of ours uh, in Switzerland, a uh, beautiful, beautiful office. And after the person I was talking with got done telling me how they have the world's largest SAP integration, they told us a story about how they had spent the last five years getting rid of all of their development talent because IT didn't matter. And so they put together a big seven-figure outsourcing deal and then mobile hit, and they had no capacity to serve customers in that mobile channel. They were faced with having to rebuild their development organization because, in fact, while IT may not matter, the custom capability that created the customer experiences that allowed them to delight customers to have unique capability, turns out that did matter, and it mattered a lot. Maybe many of you are in that situation where you're faced with rebuilding your development capability or you're paying top dollar for the digital agencies that are helping build these applications to drive these customer experiences. Part of that unique differentiation is personalizing their customer-facing web or mobile experiences and consolidating those customer-facing applications to make them easier to manage, uh, to make it possible to move more quickly in keeping that customer experience fresh 
and adding new capabilities. But custom application development and the platforms that support it are on the agenda of software decision makers. So they're looking for ways to be able to do this more effectively, to be able to do it without breaking the bank. At the same time though, it's not something that's unique to those technical decision makers, those software decision makers, because um, the business is a little bit wiser now and a little bit more demanding than maybe they were in a previous generation of technology when all the technology, all the software development got put in the IT organization, that got centralized, they focused on cost and controlling and standardization. That's not the reality that the business decision makers want anymore. Increasingly, we're seeing that they are demanding more involvement in the technology decision making. The biggest reason is technology is too important for the business not to be involved. Software is eating the world, and in that sort of an environment, the developers are the chefs. The rising expectation of, uh, expectations of customers require the business to push IT to keep tech current, to do what we need to do. Our understanding uh, of technology is increasing. We're more sophisticated, we're digital natives. And so we know what can be done and we're gonna hold you accountable. So platforms have to appeal to both the business leaders as well as the technology leaders uh, that are putting them in and serve the needs of those customer facing initiatives. Now, this is where we see a lot of conflict out there with our clients, with general uh, technology firms because all too often dev managers when they're part of IT and they think about the investments that they make are conditioned to think the way that I used to think years ago when I was at Rational Software. Uh, you know, people, processes, and technology. Those are the three things. You get them right and you'll do fine. And unfortunately, as part of that, they always put process at the center. This was brought home very well to me a couple months ago. I had an inquiry with a very large bank, um, their mobile organization. It happens to be my bank. And the question was, well, what are the best practices for organizations that are delivering mobile apps? I spent about 20 minutes walking through the process, and they do lots of rapid releases, and they have 20 service teams that are delivering into the one front-end team, and uh, they're able to independently release across those different teams. We spent time, and when they got about 20 minutes in, it was like, well, you're doing a lot of the things that are best practices. What's the problem? The answer was classic. Our IT organization says that we're not doing Agile the right way. We're not following the standards. It's a good example of an organization that had put process at the center of what they were doing instead of the outcome, and specifically instead of the customer. Something that we need to think about when we think about how we gear up for the next generation of modern applications and the platforms that are gonna support the way that we build those applications. One of the outcomes of that focus on process is that all too often it leads to specialization of effort, it leads to vertical organizations, it leads to cultures uh, that do not promote flow. And we see this in our research. One of the things that we do every year in our developer survey is we ask developers a couple questions. What do you spend your time doing? How much time do you actually write code? And the results when we first started getting them back were actually kind of shocking. Uh, basically you see that only about 28%, one in four, spend three or four hours uh, a day or more writing code. So we call them developers, but they actually don't spend a majority of their time developing. 10% spend four hours a day or more writing code. 48% spend at least an hour a day building and integrating what they write. 46% spend at least an hour debugging or dealing with production support issues, essentially dealing with the technical debt in their organizions. 45% uh, spend at least an hour a day designing new functionality, which is good, um, and 33% spend at least an hour a day unit testing. That's also good. So there's some good and some bad. But when you think about platforms, one of the questions to ask when you're evaluating any platform is how is this gonna get me to the point where I'm getting more time spending the things that actually add value from a customer perspective, writing new code, validating that that code works, deploying that code. These are the tests by which we judge a platform. Now, when we look further at some of that information, we also see that it's not just about the platform. I think it's very important to understand that tools, uh, you know, we used to say a fool with a tool is still a fool. If you don't take 
the processes and the organization and change that to reflect the new reality of business wanting to get more involved, you still see a real impact to the amount of flow in organizations. So communication time across boundaries also adds up. We find that uh, people spend way too much time in meetings. They spend way too much time doing email. They spend way too much time doing activities which get them out of the flow. And then they have to refocus when they're writing code. We also see, as I mentioned, that they spend too much time deploying code. 30% of developers spend an hour a day deploying code. So one of my questions to Richard is, how is PCF going to help reduce that for me and let me spend less time deploying the code that I'm writing and more time actually writing that particular code? Now, if you don't believe me in this data, I happened to be uh, perusing Twitter the other day, just yesterday, when I was working on my speech, came upon this uh, tweet by John, uh, John Cutler. He's just a random developer out there, in some, somebody that uh, follows somebody that I follow. And their team spent a week just tracking all of their activities. And what did they find? Well, they spent about 27% of their time over a week's period on focused sprint work. Whole bunch of other things going on. So flow is critically important to high performance. And the platforms have to enable it, but so does the process, the culture, and the organization. So while it's easy to you know, look at a platform and say, this is our salvation. All we have to do is buy it. Let's buy the tool, and we're good. We have to understand that that's a very facile reaction, because there's more that we can do in our organizations uh, to enable platforms, but you know, it's only one leg in the three-legged stool. So the way that we do better is we start by putting the customer at the center of delivery instead of the process at the center of delivery. We invest in high-performance development culture. Without that culture, it doesn't really matter how good our tools are uh, because we spend way too much time in flow-killing activities. We focus on scaling the results, not the processes. When I talk to organizations about scaling their agile investments, I often point them to the Spotify model as opposed to something like uh, SAFE or Scrum of Scrums because I feel like it's a better model that focuses on results as opposed to more process. This comes from somebody who used to go and sell process, the Rational Unified process, in fact, all 10,000 pages and 47 different deliverables. Um, we need to focus on operational efficiency that is flow-related as opposed to focused on individual productivity. It's one of the things I like the best about the VS uh, code demo uh, today because it was really focused on connecting the dots and enabling more speed. And then finally, as developers, what we need to do is to accept that we are responsible for more than just checking in our code or calling the right, right APIs on the platform. We're also responsible for the security of the code we write its performance, its scalability, um, its customer experience, and the net business results that it drives. I've got a friend of mine that uh, works at Netflix, and I asked him one time, how do you measure your developers? He said, oh, it's simple. We measure them on the number of hours of video our customers watch a month. It's business results. And we empower them to try to drive that number up. Critically important. So if you're thinking about a holistic model that involves tools and technologies, platforms, it's one of six levers that you can drive as you think about your own cultural transformation. But the other levels are also important. The structure of your organization, the culture of your organization, the talent that you acquire, the metrics that you use to measure them. You should make sure that across all of those levels you are focusing on a process that is customer-led, that is driven by insights. That's why learning is enabled and becomes so important. It's fast from a delivery perspective and connected between the business and technology. So if a platform can't help me do these things, then it is of less value uh, to me when I'm looking to build modern applications. So let's talk a little bit more uh, about platforms. It looks like my box got moved down one. We see platforms as one of five key strategies that all businesses will use uh, to source the applications that they build over the next five to ten years. The first three are pretty traditional. We can hire whoever we can find and we can industrialize delivery. 
That's the process model. That's the safe model, the scrum of scrums model. Let's use process to put guardrails around people not really worrying about how talented they are or how, or how productive they are and build a software factory. That can work. It doesn't always result in the kind of applications that you want. The alternative model is to hire above average talent and get agile in spirit to enable them through uh, uh, creating an autonomous culture, a culture of mastery, and a culture of shared purpose. That model can work very well, and that's where you see folks like Spotify doing very well with their scaling models. You can also hire somebody else to do it, and increasingly we're seeing organizations hire digital agencies and specialists. It's one of the reasons you see the large SIs buying those digital agencies uh, to get those creative folks to deliver the capability. But beyond those three obvious strategies, we think there are two others that are emerging that are going to become extremely important. Low code is a strategy to talk about on another day. It's number four here that I think is really important. Adopting packages, open source tools, and platforms that allow us to write less code. From a developer perspective, it's a little bit shocking to talk about that because that's what we do. It's like saying, adopting musical instruments that let us write or play less music. Why would we want to do that? Well, some code matters more than others. Code that looks at infrastructure, code that looks at the you know, communications down at the lower level, uh, code uh, that uh, doesn't, per, you know, is not germane to business results, simply isn't as valuable as the code that codifies the business rules, that drives the revenue, that increases the customer experience. And that's where we want to spend our time. And that's the role that any platform, PCF hopefully, can play in letting us as developers write less code and write code that matters. We see this happening with platforms now, but we also see platforms evolving. And this is kind of the last thought that I want to leave you with. Um, Platforms are changing uh, to be more microservice oriented, to be more cloud enabled. And even in that world, we see um, a sea change in terms of how platforms themselves are constructed. We think about the traditional cloud model that a lot of developers are dealing with right now. The first question they answer is, what level am I going to come in at? Am I a hardcore developer that needs bare metal capability in the cloud? Or am I a, a, a classically trained developer that wants instance types and wants to get in and really work with all those different constructs at the IaaS level? Am I more interested in business logic and I'm willing to work at a PaaS level? Or do I not have developers if I'm a software development leader and I need to go with a SaaS-based solution? We think that that world is very quickly evolving into something which is much more mixed, and it's something we're starting to write about in our research. One where there are core services that platforms provide at the base layer, but are very tightly wrapped with a set of domain services. Um, I thought the Scotiabank presentation uh, in today's keynote was an excellent example of that. Their creation of a banking as a service platform was a specific instantiation of a set of domain services, banking related, that uniquely identified their needs and the value and the services that they were providing to their business. We think that every organization is going to have to create what we call that digital application platform. Now, I don't think you should go out there and write your own core services. You're probably not experts in SDN. You're probably not experts in the right instance types or the bare metal capabilities. There are lots of places you can go to get that, and that's the value that platforms play. And I think that PCF has a role to play at that core, given you the platform services that you need to then build the domain-specific services that drive your business that allow you to create the right customer experience that is uniquely differentiated from your competition and allow you to spend more time focused on writing the code that matters. At least that's what any valuable platform should do. So I want to thank you for giving me a little bit of time to set you up, Richard. I'm pretty sure you can knock down uh, the, um, the charges that I've given you. But what I would leave you with is the following. Make sure that you shift your focus in terms of how you're delivering capabilities from a process-centric approach to a customer-centric approach. Put the customer at the center of your activities. Um, break down your organizational silos and focus on flow and demand that your platforms allow that to happen as part of your investments. Fix your culture or just remember that a fool with a tool is still a fool. Choose your sourcing stra strategies based on what you can realistically accomplish can't all necessarily get top-tier developers, 
uh, and keep them. Uh, so you have to make sure that you adapt those five strategies to the reality of your organization. But of those strategies, understand that modern platforms and frameworks abstract and simplify, and they provide a key value as part of that. And then finally, what is your Scotiabank platform? What is your digital application platform? What are the services that you are building? And how do you make sure that you're spending all of your time building those and not the non-value added services or capabilities uh, that really don't set you apart in terms of the business results that you drive? So with that, thanks. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's good stuff. Good. So I listened closely there. What I heard was PCF will solve all of those things. That's what I heard you say. I'm a bad listener. So, yeah, so I'm going to dig into, you know, really build on some of that, though, and talk about where did we come up with PCF2O's kind of vision and purpose, what, what's in it, right? I mean, I'm going to go through your first look at what PCF contains now, some of the low-level features, and again, some demonstrations. Uh, disclaimer, I'm going to say a lot of things that aren't true, or, well, no, I think they're all true, but some of these are future-looking. Not everything I'm talking about is shipping right now, so usual disclaimers of uh, that sort of thing. So what's shaping your future? What are the four things that kind of shaped where we went with PCF and PCF 2.0? And you know, the first one was that, some to this point, people using multi-cloud, people trying to focus on business value. And so how are we trying to think of what's the right platform to help people focus on self-service and team enablement? We're also seeing people speeding up. So as people start to figure out how to do software better, they start running faster. So were we going to give them the right platform to do that? Was PCF as it stood the right way to do that? At the same time, thinking about how are we tackling things around security? People seem to be losing their jobs over security. That's not great, but it puts a, a focus on these things that this matters as much as anything. And then new architecture. We spent a lot of days today on reactive and thinking about new programming styles, event-driven, real-time, but also batch and traditional ways. So were we offering the right things to do all of that? Now, of course, the transformation's real. You pointed out Scotiabank. You have companies like T-Mobile that used to take months to ship anything, and now they ship same day. Or you've got companies like Liberty Mutual that figure out MVPs and ship them in a month and make money pretty quickly after that. Comcast has a 1,500 developer strong team with four people supporting them. That's pretty cool. And at the same time, seeing companies like Home Depot, who you might not expect to ship a ton of software, shipping a ton of software. And that's great, right? Every company of all sorts of industries are doing some fun stuff. So they've proven that PCF works for them, but we weren't necessarily satisfied with that because we see this sort of continuum. So what we see specifically is that containers don't kill PaaS any more than serverless kills containers, right? We are building more software and this software complements each other, right? It doesn't replace each layer, but there's things you want to do as you move up that stack a bit. I want to be able to ship faster, so I like the abstractions as I move further up. I like the less operational cost. But then sometimes they need flexibility because I want things at a hardware IaaS level. And so we see this as a logical collection of things that are additive. To Ansi's point, it's not or, it's and, right? So a few months ago, we seemed to do a project management based on what James Waters tweets. So I'm kidding, we have great project management team. But in this case, he likes to get ahead of the game and say the four abstractions we cared about at Pivotal are containers, data, functions, apps, and that that's what PCF should be. And so the team before this, I promise, was working on a number of these things, and really that came to fruition as this. So the idea of PCF 2.0, any app, every cloud, one platform, saying I almost want this sort of operating system for the enterprise where I'm running applications, I'm running containers, I'm running functions, I have a whole set of brokered services, but I want the same management control plane like Bosch underneath the whole thing, and this should run on-premises and vSphere and OpenStack, and I also want this in the cloud and Azure and AWS and GCP. And so this is what PCF 2.0 is, pieces of this obviously shipping today, some of this continuing to move forward, but we think this represents the platform that satisfies some of the velocity needs as well as the different types of apps we're building. So let's drill into some of this. So Pivotal Cloud Foundry, what's kind of beneath PCF? So if you're familiar with Bosch, you know, this is the uh, platform underneath that helps really build and run a Cloud Foundry. So you have all kinds of things that this thing does. It actually embeds the OS, embeds the Ubuntu OS, Windows OS, kind of embedded in the platform takes care of server provisioning. So the first step of PCF is not find an awesome cluster. 
It is give us your credentials to your environment and we'll go blow the whole thing out. Build VMs, lay down software, start services. So it actually builds the VMs. Think something like Terraform. But also deployment across clusters, health monitoring. So it's not just build it, but almost like a configuration management tool to actually make sure the software is up and running. Right? Software dies, restart it. Server heartbeat doesn't come back. Let's go ahead and do something else with that. So monitors the service state, uses a resurrector. If that node goes offline, we'll just replace the node, which is awesome. Handles persistent storage. So when we do upgrades, we can actually detach a volume, replace the VM, attach the volume back again. So that storage management is pretty unique. And then the rolling upgrade. So the whole point is that companies like Comcast will tell you they do upgrades on Friday afternoons during business hours. I'm a customer, I don't seem to notice that. That's awesome, right? Upgrades should not be happening in the wee hours of the night on a Saturday. But because you can do rolling upgrades and you're doing this incrementally using canaries built into Bosch, that's a big foundation. That's what lets us do containers and apps and functions in the same place. Also mentioned this, but right now you can do continuous delivery of your platform, not of your apps. You can do that too, but that's, we know how to do that. This whole idea of doing CI and CD of the platform. And so right now, when there's a stem cell update, that's the base OS in a Bosch deployment, when we update that stem cell, maybe there's a Linux zero day that we patch, whatever it is, and we can do up to 10 of these a month, you can have this set up through Concourse to automatically pull that in, roll it out to your environment with zero downtime. That's how you run an always available platform and you can do this today. CredHub, big piece for secrets. How do you store secrets in your environment? So we support the CredHub today, a number of services use this. We've made some updates I'll talk about for using this more, but this gives you some remarkably great credential storage in a Cloud Foundry environment used by PKS, used by Pivotal Application Service as well. And then NSX. I don't know, I don't, I mean, I'm pretend to be a developer, I don't really like doing networking. So I like when this stuff is self-service, when it's automated, and involves no tickets. And so NSX is a really powerful solution from VMware. We are really doubling down on our integration with that with PCF to make sure that configuring networking is straightforward. And of course, we were doing multi-cloud before multi-cloud was cool. So Right now, you can do Bosch and CPIs, which is the cloud provider interface, across all sorts of clouds, meaning you can build on any one of these clouds the exact same way. If you implement those 14 APIs, we can run on your cloud. And so that's what's made this easy. And it's great when the providers maintain them. Google maintains theirs, Microsoft maintains theirs. That's great. So this is what gives us multi-cloud. So what's new in that layer? What have we shipped that's new in that sort of base layer? Well, HealthWatch is great. So how do you have this sort of opinionated dashboard that says, I've got literally dozens, in some cases almost 100 KPIs I care about in Cloud Foundry. How do I know what I should be watching, what I should be doing? That We took all those and turned those into an opinionated dashboard that also does things like validation tests, making sure things are still running. So this is a really, really interesting solution that complements what you already have for this. But from an appearance perspective, I can see how long CF push is taking. Because you know what, as, a, as an operations team, just because the infrastructure is running doesn't mean my app experience is great, my dev experience. So I can see how long that's taking. How full are my different cells in the PCF environment? What's performance like in latency and throughput and the like? So we've taken all these KPIs and turned them into a really great dashboard. This is all just free part of PCF. Ops Manager, so if you like the fire hose, this is how you can attach all these sort of information coming out of PCF. You can tap into this fire hose and load it into Splunk, load it into New Relic, load it into all these third party solutions. So we're also adding all these Ops Manager metrics to that. So you can find out the health of your Ops Manager, feed all that to these sort of environments, which is great. We also added some role-based access to Ops Manager. So now instead of just everyone being admin, which is how I like to run on my machine, uh, we've also added a few different ones. You can have full control. You can have some restricted control. You can have full view, which is kind of a read-only access, and a restricted view. And so we're just making it easier for different people to use the Ops Manager experience without having to have, obviously, the full permission to do everything that an admin can do. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with errands in a Bosch Cloud Foundry environment, but every time you do some of these Bosch tasks, it spins up an, actually a VM to run an errand. In some cloud environments, that might take eight minutes to run, spin up a VM. So it can take longer to do some of these activities. So now we're announcing with Ops Manager that you can actually co-locate these errands, meaning I can reuse this infrastructure. And so now I'm not spinning up VMs to run these tasks. Instead, this is all just using the existing infrastructure there. So we've seen in some cases, you're cutting the update time in half. 
for doing some of these deployments because we're just reusing infrastructure now. So this is your choice. You could still spin up your own VMs for errands, but we're trying to make it simpler as well. Adding some NX NSXT, security group integration if you're using Ops Manager. So again, making it simpler to use both of those experiences from an Ops Man perspective. And I'm really excited about Azure Stack because it's obviously expressed a lot of interest in a lot of enterprises in using this sort of Microsoft private cloud stack by from Dell, uh, HP, and others in this whole appliance. So what's pretty cool is that we've built this so now PCF can target Azure Stack. You can run this the same on public cloud Azure or private. What's cool is though we use the exact same cloud provider interface for public Azure. We didn't have to build a special one for Azure Stack, it just worked. Same with the same stem cell images. So really the only thing we did was some subtle changes to Ops Manager to account for some of the differences between those environments. But now you can run the exact same platform on your public and private cloud in a Microsoft world. So this is beta, but if you are interested, let us know and we can give you access to this. And as I mentioned, you can go check it out on the show floor as well. So let's talk about the, what you're used to seeing as Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Application Service. It's kind of hard, hard for me to get used to calling it that, but that's the uh, artist formerly known as Elastic Runtime. And so this is what we all think of as the apps-centric part of this. What have we done new here? Well, as a reminder, of course, this is the multi-cloud solution. It's got the operational layer. It's got all the sort of platformy stuff for, for things like running multiple runtimes and then using a broker to connect to all sorts of third-party stuff. On top, you use things like Spring Boot and Steel Toe and other things. Of course, then you layer on your own API layer. And all of that makes out Pivotal Application Service. That's what the product is today. We know it and love it. It will continue to be that. But we're going to keep making some changes to it. So in Pivotal Application Service, what can you get today or I guess next week when we technically ship PCF 2.0? So security matters. We continue to harden some of the different paths in Cloud Foundry. So now TLS between all these different components. So as you're doing PCI compliance and other pieces where you need to be able to be sure that your traffic is secured as it goes through the entire system, TLS all over the place. So that's good and that extra spot that we wanted to tighten up there. More NS NSXT integration for container to container networking. Container networking is really cool in Cloud Foundry because traditionally if I have app A call app B, I go back up through the load balancer, kind of hairpin down there. It's fine, but sometimes I don't want app B, maybe you have a public route, or I want low latency. So with container networking right now, you can go into your Cloud Foundry environment, including Pivotal Web Services, and just say app A can talk to app B on this port and this protocol, and we immediately just bridge that connection. So now we're also gonna link that with NSXT, so that you would actually get an IP address on that NSX managed network. At the same time, we're gonna do some additional things around there, give you the same model for that, the application security groups, all the egress traffic can also be secured that way. And at the same time though, if you don't want to use NSX, completely optional, it's better with it, but it's fine without it. You can still have this sort of batteries included model that uses Silk for the container networking interface. So just try to make networking simpler, right? We don't want to have PCF get held up because you're opening tickets trying to get your VLAN set up. Like all of this can now be built through automation with Bosch when you're using NSX. So more with CredHub. So with CredHub, now we're storing service instance credentials. So think of the service brokers. Those credentials can now be stored in CredHub. First example of that is Spring Cloud Services, where we're storing all the service credentials in CredHub. Only the application can access it. And so you're going to see more and more of our services, as well as now third parties. And if you want them to use this, just tell them to, down on the show floor or over there. They should be using CredHub to store their instance credentials, making it more secure. Some other nice stuff in Apps Manager, if you like to use Apps Manager for managing your apps, you can continue to make some subtle improvements there to make your life a little easier. So two things we added here was that if you're doing auto scale, just a toggle now, I don't have to jump somewhere else and add a service and then bind it to my app, and we're just eliminating those steps and making that simpler. Same with the metrics forwarder. This again, being able to load metrics into the PCF metrics environment, these things are just toggles now. It's very straightforward, behind the scenes we take care of some stuff for you. Likewise, we added scheduler integration. So up until now, we've also had really kind of two types of apps on traditional Cloud Foundry, kind of long-running apps and then these sort of quick-running apps that are allowed to stop and they won't try to restart them. So what we added was a scheduler that says, 
beyond those little quick starting apps, maybe I want to run that app every Friday afternoon because it sweeps a database table and loads it into a data warehouse. Or maybe it refreshes the cache or does something else. All that stuff can now be configured in the UI. You just set up a little cron job that lets you set up the scheduler. So it's great. Cloud Foundry is not just for traditional web apps. Run batch apps, schedule those batch apps you're set. Another nice one, we talk about Cloud Foundry being good for spring, is that, and I'll show this off in just a second here, is trying to make sure that even the actuator endpoint around mapping pulls it in. So you can actually see all the different mappings of a different Spring Boot app from Apps Manager. It can show you which endpoints you've exposed. So I'll show you a demo of that here in just a second. But this really makes observability simpler as I can see what in the world's going on with my application. A couple other highlights. We now support multi-build pack. So if I want to have two build packs apply to the same app when I deploy it, maybe it's the Java build pack, but there's also some components where I want to have a Node.js build pack, I can run both of those and we'll show that in Apps Manager. When you run a task, you can const constrain it by memory and such. And then I'll show you as well the Steeltoe actuator. So if you're building .NET apps, we can actually make that look like a boot app and show all of its actuator metrics. So let's have some fun. So let's go ahead and show some of the Apps Manager improvements and I'll also show you some of the spring tools that Eric Gamma showed on stage, just kind of taking a boot app and deploying it to CF. That is enough of slides. All right, so let's go to Josh Long's second favorite place on the internet, uh, start.spring.io. Let's go ahead and build a demo app. Call it web app. We'll make it a web application. We'll add the actuator. Let's go ahead and generate this. I joked yesterday that I'm in marketing, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this on my desktop. I make poor life choices. So let's go ahead and get there. It needs Git. It's fine. All right, so we'll wait for this to generate this very complicated project. Download it to my machine. Feeling that anticipation right now. Reset the Wi Fi. That can't be a solution. You gotta re reboot my next option. All right, let's give this another chance. Otherwise, I'll use an app I already have on here. I think somebody back there is streaming Netflix, so if you could <laughs> cut that out, that'd be awesome. All right, I'll, I'll trust your uh, turn Wi-Fi off instruction. This is gonna play back well on the recording. I can sense it. All right, so we're getting back on Wi-Fi. Start.spring.io. Ugh, look at this. This is, this is pairing in a massive scale. S1P demo, web app, web. We'll do actuators. I will once again joke I'm putting it on my desktop. Oh, it's got to work now after getting that far. If not, I will use an existing one. And so what I want to be able to do is open this up in Visual Studio Code and show you some of the fancy Spring Boot stuff. Wi-Fi is not connecting. Oh, we're back. Oh, there we go. Nobody, nobody breathed. There we go. I'm going to save that. I'm going to unzip it. It's going to make the rest of these internet connected demos pretty wicked. Let's go ahead and open the folder. And so that Spring Boot integration is pretty wild stuff. So if I'm a, a boot developer and I don't want to use Eclipse or IntelliJ or something else, knowing I can go into my app here in Visual Studio Code and just crank through an application that understands all the annotations, all that kind of stuff, that's pretty crazy stuff. So, you know, because it's got that language server baked in, I can do REST controller here. And I can go have a hello method. Return a value. I can have request mapping. And that's going to go to the hello endpoint. So again, I get some nice type ahead sort of help there. Got to clean up after myself, so let's do goodbye. All right, and this one, let's do a little, something a little different. Let's do request mapping, but this time, let's again type ahead. It shows me the other parameters this thing expects, so I can say method equals. 
I have to remember what type it is. That's right, request mapping. Method equals request method. And we'll make this one a post. And we'll make its path goodbye. Fantastic. Very good. All right, so I've got a fully functional app. Let's go ahead into my resources as well, because it's also nice. This doesn't just affect your Java code. I can also mess with my code here, so I can make sure that, I'll make it even bigger, is I can come into my application properties and it also detects things. So I could say management, Cloud Foundry, skip SSL, because I live dangerously. Great. And so that application's all done. Now the only thing I ever have to do to make an app, a Cloud Foundry app, there's no such thing as a Cloud Foundry app. These are just Java apps, Node app, Ruby apps, whatever. So if I just want to make this thing deployable to Cloud Foundry, I can hand it a manifest. And what's nice is that these manifests also have built-in type ahead, thanks to these language servers. So I can call this thing boot web. I can go ahead and do things like give it an instance. How many instances do I want? I just want one. How much memory? It'll even give me some suggestions. Yeah, we'll use a gig. And where do I find this thing so I can deploy it, which is pretty straightforward. Just target, web app. And because I don't believe in versioning, we'll just keep it at this. And snapshot.jar. And of course, all of this is finished now. So I can go to my terminal and just do a maven clean. Let's, let's package this character. Wonderful. And then I'm gonna do a CF push, the magical command. Now, let's see how well it goes uploading a, a meg through this wonderful Wi-Fi. So let's assume that's gonna work. And so now I'm in my Pivotal Application Services environment. This is actually running on GCP. This is PCF 2.0. So while it's doing stuff, we can see in services, I've got a service here and this boot web's already coming. But if you notice for things like services, I can come in here now and bind to the service without jumping to another page. These are subtle improvements. But in the old way, I would jump to a services page and have to go create something and bind it separately. We're trying to make sure a developer doesn't have to leave a lot of the interfaces to make stuff happen here. Likewise, even with doing things like creating jobs, I can come into tasks and now create this sort of job here, which has a job name, a command, and a cron expression. So go ahead and run this thing again every afternoon, every Wednesday at five, whatever I want to do, I can run my tasks whenever I would like to. Okay, our boot application still creating containers. And then the last thing I want to show you here is the things like auto scaling. So I can auto scale with a toggle here. If I do this, it'll automatically just set things up. If I go to settings, I can immediately do the metrics thing with a deployed application at least. Let's jump to one of my deployed ones. And you'll see that using the metrics forwarder is just a toggle. Again, these are things that make it easier, right? These are subtle improvements, nothing giant, but that can be a nice little time saver. All right, so our boot web app is starting. It's a very exciting time in the life of an app on Cloud Foundry. There we go, it's running. So it's running, so I have my app running. So what I wanna show you is because it recognizes it's a boot app, right? I get a little boot icon there, that's nice. And what happens when I get that? So if I look on logs, because it knows it's a boot app, I can change the log level on the fly. I can immediately turn it into like info without restarting, redeploying anything, and get better logs, and then debug my problem and turn it back off again. That's pretty cool. I can look at threads, because apparently I can read threads. So that's exciting. I don't know what to do with this, it just impresses my friends. <laughs> uh, I can look at the app itself, so let's go to our endpoint. I can go to hello, it's me. And if I look in here, I can actually trace the requests. So I can even, the last 100 requests show up here. And not just the request, but I can look at the headers because I always, or I occasionally, screw up the headers I'm passing back and forth. So I get the whole trace of the call, which is really, really convenient there. Bless you. Uh, I can also then look under settings, and what's really cool is I can look at mappings. So let's say I was trying to call that goodbye method. Oh no, it's an error, that, that's awful. Hopefully I have a way to fix that. Well, if I look at the mappings, I might say, well, what's going on with goodbye? Oh, it's a post. And so this, this surface is every endpoint that my Spring Boot app exposes. So I can quickly see what's the bean 
right? What's going on there really is a nice way to get some visibility into even the method being called there. So that's brand new. We just added that in PCF 2.0. You'll even see this in Pivotal Web Services right now. So neat stuff, trying to make Apps Manager better, trying to make Spring Boot better on PCF. So let's talk about the next thing, which I think is really exciting. I'll show you a demo of this, which could go wildly wrong, but hopefully not, is PaaS for Windows. So what does it mean to actually run Windows 2016 containers, Windows containers in a pivotal environment today? This isn't future technology. This is what you'll be able to do here in a couple of weeks to add this to your environment. So this adds Windows Server core stem cells. And what this means is that we're actually using the Windows Server primitives for containers, right? In previous versions of Cloud Foundry, we used a bit of a creative way to containerize Windows because it had no concept of that. But now in PCF 2.0 and with Windows Server 2016, there's actually container primitives as part of the OS. And so when we do that, what's funny is a developer may never notice because CF push works the exact same. But behind the scenes, we're able to do some good stuff. I can SSH into a Windows container, which I'm gonna show you in a second, which is mind blowing. Uh, I can do things with CredHub. I can actually do proper auto scaling because we actually have CPU constraints and network constraints and the like. And so this really gives you a nice first class experience here if you're one of these developers, even using the key management services for these Windows cells. So this gives you first class Windows 2016 support right now in the platform. So let me show you that. Let me show you the wild world of Windows going along with this. So first thing I'll show you is that this is all working stuff. So in my environment, I have my ops manager environment running on G GCP. I have Pivotal Application Service for Windows. It's just a tile. The tile blows out the, the nodes. I've got three different cells running Windows here on GCP. I'm also running Pivotal Container Service because I live dangerously. So I've got both of those things running, which is great. If I, let's prove that works, though. So let's see, here's my environment. Let's zoom it just a tad more. Hopefully that's okay. And I can do CF stacks. CF stacks tells me everything I can deploy to in Cloud Foundry. So right now what it exposes is clearly Linux, the Ubuntu baked in one, 2012 R2 or 2016. All of these are valid stacks now in Cloud Foundry for my apps. So I'm using Visual Studio for Mac here. And before this session, I built a little MVC Windows app. It's just regular Windows application on my Virtual Studio for Mac, which still feels weird, but this is a regular Windows app. Uh, there's nothing special to this app at all. It's just a new project sort of app. And all I did was say, give it a name. I told it which stack to use. And I'm using the actual build pack for the hostable web core. So it's kind of running it in a little lightweight IIS within the Windows container. So let's go ahead and push that character. So where am I? So let's go ahead and PCF ASP MVC Windows. There I am, so let's go ahead and CF push. Again, CF push is the only thing I have to do to take a Windows app, a .NET app, and push that to a Windows cell, have it containerized, have things just work. So this is pushing it up to that environment. Luckily it's small, but you'll see it's containerizing. And then what I can do after that is manage the whole thing. So while that's loading, I'm gonna go into GCP because, I mean, I think we have a good relationship. I don't know if you trust me. So I'm going to go ahead and SSH into the box and prove it's creating containers. So here I am. I'm going to SSH in. I'm in GCP. I'm going to actually log into that Windows cell and show you containers getting created on the machine itself, allegedly. All right, I like our chances here. Things are happening. Good. So I just need to add a couple of environment parameters here so it knows where my Bosch environment is because I have to log in. And I have to tell it where my certificate is. Great, now I just have to Bosch log in. All right. Well, we do have a good relationship. I don't trust you at all, so I'm not gonna just type this in in front of you. I'm not a madman. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy my password, paste that in. Wonderful, so if I do Bosch VMs, this will show me all the VMs I have in my environment. This is a small footprint, so this is only running a handful of VMs, right? Ansi talked about small footprint today. You can run Cloud Foundry in production on four nodes if you want to. You don't have to do the big size anymore. We're doing, I think, eight or nine here. And so what you'll see, though, is I have three Windows VMs, which is pretty wild. So if I go into that VM, I can boss Bosch SSH into that node. So I'm gonna go into one of those three cells. 
which is great. All right, so you got, I got a C prompt here. Worlds collide, so I'm into this environment. Let's go ahead and PowerShell. And I want to run the get compute process PowerShell command, which will show me any containers on this machine. And there is one from the app I just deployed. That's interesting. All right. So let's go ahead and go back to my app. I've clearly stretched this out long enough where the app should be deployed. Awesome. So ASP Windows, so this app's online. Let's go ahead and see if it's actually online. We'll go ahead and view it. And so this is a Windows app, hopefully running in a Windows container on PCF on GCP. I should have a drum roll. I should have some other anticipatory sounds. It's a team effort. Good. I like seeing that. No, the refresh is going to be good, even better. So I'm going to refresh that, give that a second. But what I'm also going to do is go ahead and scale this to a few different nodes because I want to see more containers get blown out. Right? I want to prove that this is actually blowing out individual containers. There we go. Yes, I'm getting slow clap guy. It's very important. Now, wait, there's more. So what I really want to show you, though, is the uh, exciting world of CFSSH, ASP Windows. Hold on, C prompt. What the what? So I am SSH'd into a Windows container thanks to the CF command prompt. That's right. And if you're like me, I keep typing in LS, which doesn't work. <laughs> DIR. So I got DIR here. But then I have all the things we know and love, favorites, links, music, things I've never used on a Windows box, <laughs> are uh, all there and ready for me. Now, if I'm a normal human, I would just then do something like PowerShell and get back to a, a proper prompt. So I can see, again, even here, CFSSH, I can PowerShell in, get some obscure errors, and see what happens here. Out of memory, good. I'm breaking things left and right. This is awesome. So let's quickly go back, though, <laughs> to this. And now I have different containers, right? I did see I scaled it. When I did scale my app, notice it was adding more Windows containers. So this is first class. This is not doing any weird stuff. We're actually creating Windows containers in this environment, which is pretty cool. All right. I promised 70% working demos. That was I'm like 82 right now. That was good. Pivotal Container Service. So this is the other thing we talked about today. We're going to talk about this a lot more tomorrow. There's some good breakouts on this, but let me give you a bit of a sneak peek. Same with Function Service, which I'll give you a sneak peek into too. Just don't tell Mark Fisher, who has a big talk tomorrow. Pivotal Container Service. So what this is, this is the collaboration that originally started with Google and Pivotal, building Project Kubo, Kubernetes on Bosch. Then we worked with VMware to actually productize this and bake in a lot of cool parts. So we want to give you the Kubernetes dial tone. And really, the goal of all of this is how are we making Kubernetes easier to run? We're not trying to make Kubernetes itself better. It's fine. It evolves quickly. It's great. So we're not, there's no fork. There's none of that. This is vanilla, up-to-date, latest version of Kubernetes running in a managed, Bosch-managed environment. So you get the dial tone. Just make this thing run. But what's really exciting is this control plane. So what Project or what PKS gives you is give me a cluster, five nodes, 10 nodes, 50 nodes, whatever. Bosch will go ahead and build that for you. Go ahead and run that thing. Do rolling upgrades. All those sort of things that, again, that's what it means to run a platform, right? Running a platform is not running a Terraform script to build a cluster. That, that's called instantiation, right? Running it, day two, means rolling upgrades, patching, monitoring, logging, user permissions, all that fun stuff. That's the problem we're trying to solve here. And so if you look at it from a technical stack perspective, it's made up of this sort of Kubernetes, Kubo kind of cluster build stuff. We're adding in the Google Cloud Platform Service Broker. So if you run this on-prem, you can connect to Google's machine learning, Google Cloud Spanner, BigQuery, all that stuff. We're baking in the open source container registry called Harbor. This gives you uh, container scanning, curation, all these really good things baked in the box. You have an on-prem enterprise-grade container registry. NSXT along the side, which gives you some really smart networking, advanced networking for Kubernetes, doing things like being able to constrain namespaces on different switches and all this really interesting stuff that we can do in some micro-segmentation in Kubernetes thanks to NSXT. So open source, vanilla. This is running right now if you go to the repo for the Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, which is the renamed Kubo. This is running 1.82. Uh, there's very few distributions even running 1.8, so we're, we're trying to make sure we stay well ahead of that. 
totally production ready, zero single points of failure. Everything from master nodes to etcd, all these pieces have redundancy built in from day one when it's built out. Multi-cloud, run this on-prem, run this in the public cloud, you have the exact same Kubernetes dial tone dev experience with all of it. And again, because this is vanilla Kubernetes, use the same kubectl commands, use all the same plugins, use all the same ecosystem, there is nothing specialized we're putting on top of it. All this great network management is really exciting stuff. Again, that access to all the GCP services. And all, most excitingly, I think, is the automated ops pieces, is really being able to deliver an always-on sort of Kubernetes environment with no challenge there. All right, so you heard about this this morning as Anansi's really quick presentation about this, but I'm gonna give you a little sneak peek on this. We're gonna show this off on the main stage tomorrow for about 20 minutes, and then Mark Fisher has a great serverless spring session planned for the afternoon, but I don't wanna wait that long with you people. So let's talk about what PFS actually is. So what this is, is a framework that will be built into Cloud Foundry. It's an open source repo today. Go to github.com slash project riff. And this is going to be a service for executing functions in response to events. Things happen, kick up a function, right? And functions traditionally are short lived. They're pay as you go, at least in public cloud. You know, this idea that it's not our server listening for traffic. It's this sort of thing that blips up whenever something happens. So what are some core features of this I think you'll care about? So it's open source. Project Riff, open source. We're gonna build this in the open. It's gonna be public. You could run this anywhere. So we wanna make sure that there's a lot of freedom here for where you'd like to run this. It's all running on Kubernetes. So it's Kubernetes native. This really gives us some cool opportunities to not just let you deploy code to respond to events, but containers. So here's my container. Run this container in response to an event. That's very unique. If you go to most serverless frameworks, which are great, it's here's a chunk of code, go do something with it. But it can get pretty wild when you can also spin up a container instance as well. Key's gonna be cloud portable. You know, I, I love the public cloud, it's awesome. But last I checked, all of you are not there at the moment. So being able to have an actual serverless platform that runs behind the firewall, enterprise grade, always on, scalable, that's really exciting stuff as you start tapping into network events, start tapping into your database change events, start tapping into replace all your random shell scripts and turn those into functions. Like you can do a lot of interesting stuff now on your existing systems with a function platform that sits on premises. Multi-language, this is not Spring. Now, Spring's gonna be awesome here because the team who builds this knows how to build Spring. But you're gonna bring Node.js, you're gonna bring shell script sort of model, and you're also gonna be able to bring your own bring .NET Core, bring Go, bring these other things. The idea is this should be extensible. So it's a multi-language, open source platform. Now, for me as an integration person, a person who likes app integration, I love the first class eventing. So it will natively talk to things like Kafka, RabbitMQ, Kinesis, Google Pub Sub. That's the idea, is for it to make sure that that can also be a way to invoke events, not just HTTP requests, but hey, there's a message on the bus, think IBM MQ. Wouldn't it be great to trigger a function because of an event going through our MQ series environment? So the idea is that this is gonna be something I can easily plug into those brokers. We'll show it off tomorrow, hooking up to Kafka. But making eventing a first class citizen makes this product really, really interesting. And of course, we'll sell it and, and hopefully make some money on it. But it's gonna be a supported product, right? The goal is to make an enterprise product as part of PCF that also connects to those other things you know and love. So PFS, really, really exciting stuff. It's probably the thing I'm, I'm most pumped about. But of course, the service marketplace is exciting too. We've made a lot of changes here. So Spring Cloud Services 5, if you're not familiar with Spring Cloud Services, this is how you run some of the machinery behind Spring Cloud in a managed way. So think of a config server that's part of Spring Cloud Config or a Spring Cloud Service Registry, right, Eureka, that's gonna be my phone book for the cloud. All these things are, can be run as a managed service, updated, maintained, thanks to Spring Cloud Services. So now you can bring your own data source to this before we would kind of provision one for you. Now go ahead and bring your own backend data service for some of those components. We're adding some new search parameters to the config server. We're the first service here using CredHub for all the instance credentials. And we've updated to the latest version of Spring Cloud. So this is now gonna be available with PCF 2.0. Concourse for PCF, I mentioned that earlier. Some good stuff coming in here. This is that piece you can use to actually update Cloud Foundry automatically which is exciting. So you can increase the stability. We've done some cool things here. We've actually pulled out the Postgres database that we'd embedded that was a little wonky. Now it's its own, you can use your own outside. 
a really nice multi-pipeline dashboard that's there, so we have a lot of pipelines. It's a way to actually visualize the health of your entire environment at one time. More metrics with a nice emitter for Prometheus. And some bug fixes, because that's what you're supposed to do with software. So there's four pivotal data services that we sell. We sell MySQL, and the things we did there is we've added leader follower. So now an on-demand cluster of MySQL that has a leader follower model. Right now, on-demand services, Ansi mentioned, have been single instance, right? I want a MySQL instance. Great, here is a server. Th that's fine in many cases, but I might want my production traffic in a single instance node. So now you'll have a choice of an on-demand cluster, still just CF create service MySQL, get it instantly, but it's leader follower that gives you some cross availability zone redundancy. Pivotal Cloud Cache is this opinionated slice of Gemfire, the in-memory data grid that Pivotal helps maintain. And so Cloud Cache is a really powerful way to do both session state caching, look aside caching, but we're adding WAN replication. So now I can actually have cross-site replication, active-active, and synchronization of my cache. So pretty powerful stuff, and I can actually have cache updated on both sides and have it properly synchronized on both ends. And we're adding right behind. So you can actually deploy code to your cloud cache and have it right back to the database asynchronously after you've updated the cache. So this makes PCC really, really interesting. It's worth giving it a spin. RabbitMQ, Pivotal is the primary maintainer of RabbitMQ. We keep trying to make this better, both in the open source, we just shipped 3.7, but also over here in PCF. So we also added on-demand clusters as well. So right now, any of you could get an on-demand cluster of Rabbit of multiple sizes. And again, you might have RabbitMQ cluster for this team or this team or this app or this service. It's just nice not to have everything crammed into a single tenant, even multi-tenant, single instance, right? Where you're all coupled to the same upgrade schedule and maintenance window. Sometimes it's good to have some of these things on demand. And then we keep updating Redis as well, making sure that Redis is a great in-memory cache as well for the applications and the ecosystem that likes using Redis. We continue to build our own product that delivers Redis as a service. So I've thrown a ton of stuff at you. You know, again, PCF 2.0, the vision for this, a lot of it's what's shipping next week in terms of PKS as an initial installation for initial availability, as well as PAS. And then PFS is under active work. We plan on shipping that in 2018. This marketplace is already there. And the goal is to stripe across things like networking, security, and others across this. So you really don't have this weird or choice when you're deploying apps and you're dealing with platforms. It's focused on velocity and a single management control plane, regardless of which abstraction you pick. So we're trying to do a lot of stuff here at Pivotal, making sure you have the platform, the tools, and the process, because any one of these alone will not make you good at software. As Jeffrey mentioned, platform is great, tools are great. I don't want to be a fool with a tool. So it is important to think about the whole spectrum. I think that's why it's uh, hopefully fun to mess around with Pivotal on this. So thank you for that. I'm at Arsaroder on Twitter. I'm here if you have any questions, but. There's more stuff this week on PKS, there's more stuff on PFS, there's a few more deep dives into PCF components, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.